joining us today for um, museums, new approaches in collections, care, and community engagement. I just want to let everyone know that we'll be starting in about five minutes. So if you have any mobile devices, beeping devices, please turn them to silent at this point. And, you know, if you need to run to the restroom, please do that. Um, again, we'll be starting in five minutes, so please take your seats. Thank you. Uh, welcome again, everyone, to the Culture Academies in conversation with Mr. Vino Daniel, Chairman of Oz Heritage and CEO of India Vision Institute. Um, it is my pleasure today to welcome today's speaker, Mr. Vino Daniel, and today's moderator, Ms. Loheng Noi, Director of the National Collections, NHB, National Heritage Board. To begin, uh, to, or to start us off today, I would like to invite Ms. Tangam Kartigishu, the Director of the Culture Academy, to say a few words and introduce the speaker, Ms. Tangam. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. It's very nice to see some familiar faces and some new faces. And thank you very much for taking time to come and listen to this interesting talk today. And welcome to our first In Conversation lecture for this year. Um, and um, this series, just to give you a little bit of spiel about what this series is about, it's called In Conversation With, and we hold it thrice a year, uh, every year. And this is actually a platform for us to showcase some of the thought leaders in the arts and culture sector uh, in Singapore. They could be in Singapore, or they could uh, be from overseas, and to get them to share their experiences in their respective fields so that we can uh, open up more horizons for ourselves and as well question the way we do our things. Uh, sometimes we do things uh, and it's very effective, but maybe there are other things that other people have tried which could actually maybe make us think about what we are doing, why we are doing it, and why we are doing this way. So we hope that every time you come to this, uh, we, we call it a thought leadership program, uh, we hope that you go away with new ideas and you rethink what you're doing. Uh, so in other words, trying to um, sort of force open the envelope and open your horizons. Okay, very quickly, um, it gives me great pleasure actually to introduce Dr. Uh, Mr. Vinod Daniel. Um, he is actually a very engaging person. I think he went around talking to a few people as well. And I will do a very short introduction because if I were to really talk about his CV, it's very, very long. And I'll be sitting here and I'll become the lecturer for the day. So very quickly, um, Vinod actually wears many hats and he's currently the chairman of Oz Heritage in Australia. He's the vice chairman of the International Council of Museums Committee for Conservation. Uh, he's the president of the board for the Australian Operations of the Center for Environmental Education and the director of the Brian Holden Vision India Private Limited. And he's the CEO of Indian Vision Institute. And he's the CEO of India Heritage Private Limited. And of course, he's the CEO of his own consulting firm called Daniel Heritage Services Private Limited. Okay, uh, I think um, it's really my honor now and pleasure to invite Vinod to talk to all of you about his topic on new approaches in collections care and community engagement. Vinod, please. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's good to be here. I think I've got to wake people up. I mean, it's a time of the day when sleep slowly comes in, right? Um, it's really good to be here. I want to thank the National Heritage Board and the Culture Academy for making it possible for me to come and speak. Uh, thank you also, all of you, for being here. I think it's, it's, it's great to have all of you here. Uh, my understanding is it's going to be an informal afternoon. So my role here is going to be, I'm going to be speaking for maybe about 30, 35 minutes. Hopefully, I'll get some thoughts floating. And after that, we'll have a time for questions and discussions. So I think the more questions that come from the floor, the more we can discuss on other things, if that's OK. Um, now, it's quite difficult for me to come to Singapore and talk on a topic like this because I think what you've done here is amazing. I've come to Singapore for the last 20 years. Just watching the transformation here is phenomenal. More than the transformation, I think the excitement you have in what is happening and the new ideas and thoughts that come, which 
I wouldn't see anywhere in the world, whether it's a US or, or, or Australia or anywhere. I think the, the profession has matured quite a bit out there. Uh, maybe they're, they're a bit more relaxed, but you still have the drive. I mean, I think the museum sector here is bubbling and growing, and I think it's, it's amazing. So I feel a bit intimidated to share what I'm going to share here, but I'll still do it. I don't have a choice now. Uh, but what, what I'm going to do here very much is I'm going to talk about 10 things that are things I've noted in my travels, and they're not relevant to, to what Singapore should be doing, but that is what is happening globally. So just in terms of a broader context, I'll share those things. And after that, you can just pick some aspects that are, that are relevant, and then we can have a chat on that. Now, what right do I have to speak about this? I thought I'll probably justify why I'm saying these things. I worked in museum projects probably in a bit more than 40 countries around the world. And, and it's, it's amazing traveling, seeing what they do, and kind of learning from those. And what I find really exciting is to learn from one country and then try to see how this could be applied somewhere else. And that's what I thought I'll do you know, during the brief half an hour discussion I'm going to have. And officially, I worked for the Australian Museum for 15 years. Before that, I used to work for the Getty for five years. And that also gave me a good understanding on how big museums operate. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is the whole issue of relevance. Um, now, any time I go to the UK, so I'm flying often between, let's say, India and the US, and I do a transit stop in, uh, in, in London. Now, all the museums are clustered together in one zone, um, and often I stay there, take it trained to that, that location, it's so hard to get into the station and get off the station on the weekend because so many people want to go to museums. And they all tend to congregate around you know, that, that particular zone. And that's so encouraging. And often, you know, that, that really uh, makes me you know, pleasantly surprised at, at the interest that they have. But when I go to some other countries, I often think, look, if they close this museum, is anyone going to care? And I think how you really make it really relevant to the local community is quite important, and Singapore does it, does it you know, extremely well. Let me show a few, um, you know, let me share a few stories on, on what I've seen in some of the parts of the world. Now, in the island of um, Vanuatu, Vanuatu is, is a country very much in the Pacific Ocean, probably about two, three hours you know, flight from Sydney. They have a national museum. They call it a national cultural center. One exciting way they connect with the community is it's actually a group of many small islands. And all through the whole country of Vanuatu, uh, there could be you know, 70, 80 small islands. The museum has got one person who they call as a field worker who's based in different parts of the greater Vanuatu, could be in, in a different island. And what they do through the year is they try to collect any information that, that they can on both the tangible and the intangible aspect. So they're sometimes given a video camera or a still camera, especially now with the phones, you can take pictures. All that is brought back into the main museum once a year. And they've got an excellent storage system, which is climate control, very low temperatures, and all that is stored. So they're collectively storing what the whole country has. It's a good way for them to document. There are some language groups that are disappearing. They might have a video of that, so it's excellent. But more importantly, they have this conference that they do once a year. And in the conference, they have a bit of a discussion on what should be key priorities. And that comes from grassroots. And I thought that's a good way for connecting with with a broader country that is not that well connected, and the museum becomes the central agency to do it. Other examples of source communities. Often, when you live in places like Australia, you would have diasporic communities. Say, I'm from India, I'm settled in, in Australia, so I'm part of the diaspora. 
in Australia, you'll have a lot of people from Pacific Islands who are settled out there. They all become communities that get disconnected from the cultures where they come from. And there is an issue on what can the museum do to connect back to those cultures. And also, there is an issue where sometimes you would have collections from certain cultures where those collections no longer exist. I'll give you an example. You take Samoa or Tonga or one of those islands, you might have certain materials that are made of organic materials. Over the last 100 years, I think most of the conservation people would know, insects and, and a whole range of other issues would have totally destroyed them. The only collections that they have are the collections that are now in some of the bigger museums, such as the Australian Museum. How do you connect back to those source communities? And I think those are important aspects. A few examples. Sophie is from a, a small island called Eremango. That's also part of the greater uh, Vanuatu. Now, she um, came down to the Australian Museum during the time when I was there. She spent a month, and her whole objective was she wanted to doc document how the bark cloth collection at the Australian Museum was. And her interest was to look at the design, to look at the manufacturing technique, et cetera, et cetera. So she was given unlimited access. She took a lot of uh, photos. She took videos, went back, spoke to the elders who are based in her island, and then tried to recreate some of these things back. So this whole collection was totally destroyed in their island because of a whole range of reasons. And one of the primary reasons was when the missionary movement happened, these people couldn't wear those bark clothes and go to church. So they had to remove those clothes and leave it in a room and dress up differently to go to church. And eventually, those clothes you know, got, got destroyed or burned or whatever it is. So you know, there's a whole range of stories on how they lost it, but immaterial, immaterial of how they lost it. Um, them having some of those collections back at a major museum, how can the big museum help one of these communities to get back at least bits of it? Now, these collections that they remake won't be the same as what was before. It could be a hybrid. It's also good for the museum because the museum can further collect. And also, the good thing for the local community is when tourists come, this is something they can sell. So that makes it more sustainable. Sorry, I'm rushing through it. Later on, during the, the question time, you can probably ask you know, more questions. This is also an interesting program. So the first few examples would be from the time when I was at the Australian Museum. This one is, there's a very substantial Pacific Island community in Sydney. The, one of the problems with uh, that community was the younger people, in terms of the criminal justice system, the younger people who were arrested for some aspect or the other, in terms of percentage, were much more than any other community. So there was quite a bit of crime that was part of it. And one of the theories was just because they came from a different culture where respect and other things you know, were very important, now they come to a different culture where it's not something that is, is highlighted more. What can a cultural institution do? So part of this project was trying to get people from the juvenile justice, justice system to come and spend time with their collections. And typically what you do is you get some of the role models who would be rugby players, who, you know, because they all look up to these people, they all want to play rugby. And they would come, talk a little bit, take the collections, talk about respect and all that. But trying to analyze the impact it has might take many years. But in terms of a concept, I thought it's a good way to connect to you know, some of the diasporic communities. This is one other example. So this is Lawrence from Solomon Islands. Now, there's, um, there's a huge wealth of collections from Solomons, which was again at the museum. And what uh, was done with those collections was nearly all of them were uh, digitized. There were digital copies made, plus a whole range of videos and other things were made. They were put in a suitcase, in an interactive way, and he wanted to take that and put it in some of the local markets where the local community could come and touch and play. I mean, it was done in a very robust kind of way that it, it could 
it could be uh, you know, handled quite roughly. And also there was a recorder there where the local community might say, look, this particular one is not from Solomons. You know, it's here by mistake. So it's a way you can correct your collection database too. Because whatever is in a database doesn't have to be exactly correct. Is that okay? Am I rushing too fast or is that, is that okay? Now, I'll just finish my first point with just one quick comment. I think one of the things that worries people quite a lot is, look, the minute we show our collections, people would say, why are you keeping it in your museum? Why don't you repatriate it? So I just wanted to tell you a, a very simple story. That's Chief Jerry Taki. I was there in the storage area with him when a reporter from the Sydney Morning Herald wanted to do, ask something so that he can put something controversial in the next day's newspaper. So he came and said, Look, you know, you're coming here spending, you know, so much time here. Wouldn't you want these collections back in, in, you know, your island? And, you know, Chief Jerry Taki, he spent, you know, quite a bit of time at the Australian Museum. So the answer he gave was quite interesting. He said, this is the dancing ground for our objects. And he said when he came in here, he felt the collections were happy. And that is all he needs. So it's not like something where he says, yeah, yeah, they got to think, you know, he, he just went right into, you know, his emotions and his feelings and what he felt. And, and I thought that was very interesting and touching in terms of, you know, how he felt and how maybe, I mean, this is just a small example, but it's not something museums should be that worried about. Okay, the second one, I'll run through this, is the whole issue of communication. And one of the, the best examples I can think of is, I don't know how many of you have seen uh, Zahi Awas on, on television. You know, he's from Egypt. He tells so many different stories. And he's an amazing storyteller. He can just take, and I'm, I, I know in the UK now they've got programs, you know, where they have an object and they can tell a story related to the object, which by itself would get the common person to come and say, look, can I go and see that object? It, you know, it's an amazing way to connect. And I just, you know, thought I'll just highlight on that. The other one is, is the whole issue of, of using the web, um, which you guys do it much better than many other places. But just in terms of numbers, um, a typical museum, you take the Australian Museum, you might get half a million through the door and 25 million through the web. So you get an audience of maybe as much as 50 times coming through the web. So in terms of how it's growing, it's phenomenal. So it's something to always keep in mind on how you can make it much more, you know, uh, vibrant because when I mean, people want to see new contents and new change, and that by itself is an art. So this yesterday when I went to the national to, to the heritage collections uh, heritage collection center uh, was 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 good to see. I think you know you're all pushing that in that direction. The third one is um, uh, the whole issue of intangible heritage. Now, there's a small video I'll play and just have a look at it. Um, the whole intangible thing really makes me interesting is because I go to a museum, I might see 50 spears. I get bored. All the 50 spears look the same. You look at two spears, you say, look, time to move to the next one. And that's where something like this makes it so much more exciting to go to a museum. The next one. Yeah. Yeah. It takes a minute to choose. Actually, you can read it. So even if the sound's okay, don't don't worry. You Okay. 
Sorry. So when you have a, vi a video like that, so this is one of the chiefs who came, looked at the spears, he picked one and started singing. So I, I don't know whether you all got the gist of it. So each spear has got a particular way it's made and it takes a trajectory. So if there are two groups fighting, when they throw it, they'll sing a song. And that tells the other group what trajectory it'll take. And the, the whole idea is, once you know it, it's up to you to dodge, otherwise you die. So it's, 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 a, it's an interesting thing in warfare, but I wouldn't have known other than him coming and telling. So that whole thing is the whole intangible heritage part, which makes it so much more interesting because the next time you see the spear, you'll kind of think, oh, look, what trajectory would that take and, 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 and how was it used? Is that okay? The fourth one um, is the whole issue of distributed national collections. I don't know how it is in Singapore, but in many parts of the world, more than 90% of collections are not in museums. So what do you do about the majority of collections in a country? What role does museums have to look after these things? Because what museums typically do is a very small percentage. They do it very well. But how do you look at it? I mean, you look at something like, I, I'm pretty sure, you know, you read the newspaper, you read about Subhash Kapoor. And if you look at the, the distributed national collections, many of them are just in temples. Anyone can come, take it, and if it gets in the wrong hands, it's going to get, get you know, uh, probably exported, you know, somewhere. There's a whole range of different things happening. What can we do to create that awareness among the society on how important it is? Because they are the best custodians. End of the day, you can't have a police protection for every, you know, object or every temple. It's only the people who can do it. So what role do we have? I think these debates are going to get more and more important in a broader context. Uh, especially, I think, when you have a high-profile case like this coming, that's when the importance gets even higher. There are lots of collections in private hands that needs conservation assistance, that needs probably, uh, you know, a little bit of tax benefit. I mean, there's a whole range of other things. But something like this has taken the debate to a much higher level on what should be done about the broader context. The fifth one is on exhibitions. So with regard to exhibitions, I mean, you do it so well here. Uh, so I won't talk about how to do an exhibition, how to put an exhibition together. But the, the big issue is the cost to put together an exhibition is getting so high. Now, you do permanent exhibitions, you do temporary exhibitions. Permanent exhibitions, once in 10, 15 years, you've got to renew it. And, and there is a cost uh, component. But for the temporary ones, a typical one in a place like Australia might cost one and a half to two million dollars. So that's quite a bit of money that you need to put in. So are there new concepts that you can do? And something interesting I saw was, you know, at the National Museum in India, they had an exhibition called a single object exhibition. There was one object that had come back from France that was seized, I think, because it was exported illegally, uh, a yogini that came back. They had an exhibition, they called it a single object exhibition. So often you might have a single object in a display case somewhere next to the cafeteria or something like that. This one, the whole exhibition was, was a single object. So right from the prime minister to everybody came to see it. And I thought that was fantastic. I mean, in terms of, you know, the, the, the cost that you put in to, you know, the returns you get, you know, I thought was, was quite, quite interesting. And I, I just thought I'll, I'll just table that in. 
Similarly, I've often wondered, I mean, there's so much talk in a place like India on the Ganges. I mean, there are millions and millions of people who go. But I've never seen an exhibition that, that highlights, you know, the whole issue, either from a science perspective on how to clean Ganga or in terms of the whole broader religious perspective. You know, things like that would really be appealing to, to, to the audience and also would connect much better with, with, with the common person. The next, the sixth one is the whole issue of sustainability. Now, sustainability, basically, museums are becoming big, big spaces. When I say museums are becoming, not all museums, but the big ones, you know, the major state museums, the national museums, all of them, they like to build it as big as possible. Now, in terms of the cost for running that is phenomenal. Um, you, you think in terms of when you're looking at, um, say, the whole issue of, um, of paying for your electricity costs. There are museums that might pay 15% of the budget on electricity costs. I know many mu big, big museums in Australia would pay up to half a million dollars. Now, if the electricity costs go up, that means one or two staff might have to go if they've got to balance the budget. So there's a whole range of initiatives that are being pushed on how to, to manage this. Right from you know, using solar power and other things too. Uh, what I, I saw was quite interesting is even going to HCC yesterday. You know, they, they were smart to change the standards so that you have a higher tolerance for relative humidity. So your set points are higher, which basically means your system doesn't have to work that hard. So these are things that I think you've got to constantly think in terms of how to bring some of these cost things down because these are costs that are getting more and more expensive every day. And that's what you know, many institutions are struggling with. The seventh one is on human resources. Um, Singapore might be different, but many parts of the world you go, especially, in the, especially the developing part, 90% of the people are not trained. Sometimes I would even say 99% of the people are not trained, and that's a big issue. How do you deal with that? Because how do you run a museum without having a team that is, that is well trained and that is quite an issue that is very relevant uh, today. Especially I think if Singapore is working internationally with other partners and that's something you know you'll probably see much more. There are probably hardly you know diploma or degree programs, not even capacity building programs they run for you know ongoing staff. Even when people are being hired to work in this institution, the selection criteria don't say you've got to have a conservation background to become a conservator. You, you need to have a curatorial background to be a curator. They're very generic. And all that becomes a problem when it comes to museum renewal because you need people with, with certain skills to do it. And I, I, I mean, it's not applicable for Singapore because you do it very well. And when it's talk about skills, it could be the technical people like conservators could also be the housekeeping people. Uh, have they been trained on how to clean a storage area well? You know, they can always come and splash water everywhere. So it's a question of, you know, you doing little things there or you having a degree and, and doing, you know, hands-on work. And that's an issue that, that one needs to keep in mind, you know, constantly. And I'll take this to a slightly higher level. We talk about museum renewal in many parts. I think you know, many of the, the, the places you go, they'll talk, look, I need to redo my museum. You know, we are really looking at it. And you know, I've played in this arena for many years. And at this point, the main questions I ask are, do you have a director there who's going to be there for the next four or five years? You know, if not, there's no point. Because you need that leadership. If, if they keep changing people at the top every three to five, you know, six months, and it's quite hard you know, for you to go and provide assistance and do it. Sorry, I'm, I'm just being very blunt in, in what I say. I think one of the key things is you need a champion like that who can take it through. The second one is, like it comes back to what I, I said before. Do you have the staff team that are trained or as part of this renewal process, you have to train them. Otherwise, any consultants you bring in, they'll come do the job and go. You've got no one here to take it forward after that. So it's quite important that that hand-holding happens. And the third thing is, there should be a certain degree of autonomy, otherwise it's very hard to run as a museum. And what the autonomy is might vary from 
country to country, but it's quite, quite good to have a board or whatever it is, to have that, that degree of autonomy. Otherwise, it becomes like, like you know, any other government department where it's, it's a lot more harder to get you know, certain approvals as part of the bureaucracy. And, and just to finish off that whole part, uh, in many parts, one also realizes that they can't implement a renewal project because there's not enough people with skills who can implement it, mainly contractors. So there are, I mean, this, this whole thing is a very specialized arena. Not every architect can come and design a museum. So they might have to work with people with that kind of skill sets. So every aspect within a museum needs a special skill set. And in, in many ways, as part of this whole training, it's also good to have some kind of an orientation slash training for people who are outside the sector who give contract services. It could be the pest control operator. It could be, you know, the, the person who does the lighting. It could be the fire people who, who are involved. And I think all those things are, are essential. And my last two points, collections. This is again a struggle that, that is happening everywhere is, everyone who wants to donate something would say, look, I want to give it to the museum. What do you do? Your collections are going more and more. In one museum, I won't name this one, they had so much collections coming, especially large sculptures. Every time the, the customs people see something that is illegally leaving, they'll give it to the museum. So they decided to, give, to make a sculpture garden. Right? So it's outside in the garden where the sculptures are thrown, they put sculpture gardens. You know, I think four or five years later, there are plants growing everywhere, you know, all over the sculptures. So it reaches a stage where I think you need to have a bit of a focus on collections. And whether you accept it or not needs to be based on some kind of a framework or policy you have. If it doesn't fit in, you might want to give the collections to some other institution that would make it fit in. And we call that the collection acquisition, deacquisition, you know, framework policy. And that's something many, many institutions are doing it more and more so that it, it's a bit more focused. And the very last point is, um, in terms of, of um, a profession, um, it's quite important nationally that you have a very vibrant professional body. Because then the profession is represented, they can speak you know, for the profession. So it could be, you know, the, like the International Council of Museum has got you know, uh, country things in every country, or it can be, you know, your, your own body. It, it, it can be anything, but having that professional body that's vibrant, it, it's quite important. And also, it's, it's good then that body can represent certain things to the government as and when needed. For example, in Australia, you might have Museums Australia, you might have ICOMs, ICOM Australia, you'll have a whole range of different bodies. But it's good to have that different voices with different, you know, angles taking things and, and representing what you want. And also it's quite important that you do have the linkage internationally because it's, it's good, it's, it's a very small domain. And the more international best practices you can bring in, the more you can give what you have internationally, the better we all become as an institution. Um, let me just close with this thought. I think, um, you know, I had mentioned this in many of my meetings. Uh, this sector here is bubbling, it's so vibrant, and it's achieved a lot, and you got runs on board that you can show as best practice examples. Now, all over Southeast Asia and uh, South Asia, I can't see any other heritage sector as vibrant as this. It'll be great if Singapore can take some of these lessons and, and, and pass it on to the rest. Whatever mechanism that's possible, you know, you know I, th I think you all would know how, how, how it works. But it's quite important that that gets passed on because it's, it's a huge success story that the rest of the world needs to know and also you know, needs to benefit from. And it's also a good soft power exercise for Singapore as it deals in a broader international arena. Thanks for your time and we should open for questions. Thank you very much for that very insightful presentation, Mr. Daniel. I, at this point, I'd like to invite um, uh, Ms. Lohang Noi on stage with Mr. Daniel. We are going to commence this afternoon's Q&A session. We have a number of m roving mics about, so please raise your hand. Um, 
perhaps before speaking, if you could introduce yourself and the organization you'd come from, this would help us greatly. All right, thank you, over to you, yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Heng Noi. Okay, I'm from the National Collections Division of the National Heritage Board. Uh, first of all, actually, I'd like to um, once again welcome Vinoid, whom I've known for quite a number of years. I think it's a privilege to be hearing from you because I know you've got tremendous experience uh, in the cultural and heritage sector and also many, many, of course, we have seen uh, projects all over the world. So, um, really, I want to take this uh, opportunity to, you know, um, well, you've shared with us the 10 uh, very key points that um, we have heard based on your experience. And uh, I think some of them are very, very fundamental, like leadership issues, skills issues, human resource issues, sustainable sustainability issues. So I think these are not new, uh, even though you, you commented that Singapore has like lots of things in good order, but I think we are also facing similar challenges as well. I think my colleagues will be out with me. So, but in any case, I think um, um, my role here is to give time to the audience to raise any comments and, and raise any questions, uh, you know, with regards to uh, you know, um, any topics that you think Vinoy could, you know, uh, expand on further. So maybe is there, you know, someone who would like to be our first? Okay. We have the mic. Yeah. Well, I'm. Uh, my name is Yungo. Uh, I'm the Honorary Secretary of the Disabled People's Association and I always speak on behalf of the people with disabilities. And you really need skills uh, in designing a museum that is accessible. Despite all these uh, universal design principles, I uh, still find that many museums are not accessible. For example, display case uh, at such a level that a wheelchair user cannot see what's on display. For example, in Peranakan Museum, you have the huge beaded tablecloth but a wheelchair user cannot see it, all right? Or, uh, you know, you may have videos without subtitles, the hearing impact cannot uh, appreciate it. So uh, we, we need all these little soft touches so that we are inclusive uh, in making your collection and your exhibition accessible to people with disabilities. Thank you. Um, maybe if you know, you can share with us, you know, some examples from, say, Australia, you know, where you know, some... You know, uh, there are ways to overcome, you know, uh, some of these, uh, you know, audience uh, barriers, so to speak, yeah. There's not much I can add, but to, to echo what you say, I think uh, we need to have that as part of our mission statement that, you know, everything we do in a museum should be accessible to everybody. So I think it's, it's work in progress. You know, for sure, the easy ones that, you know, probably in many Western museums, it's easy is, you know, in a wheelchair, they can access as many things as possible, right? From, you know, toilets to, to be able to go and, 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 you know, visit every display case and, you know, all that, you know, just in terms of, you know, width and height and those kind of things. And there is also probably a growing um, movement to, to maybe see what we can do to specific target groups, you know, people who are blind on what signage could be in, in, in Braille and, and all that. But it's, it's work in progress. And one of the things that uh, often underpins that is uh, resources. So, you know, to make that a priority and to see how we can progressively make it more and more, you know, needs to be the key. You know, right, right. I mean, I think the entry to a museum, entry to the basic service, all that needs to be accessible to everyone. When it comes to the interpretation, there is an issue of, you know, how do we keep working at it? So every year we make it better and better. And that kind of a thing needs to be part of, you know, what senior management does. So, you know, I totally agree. I can't... Hi, my name is Elvin. I run a private home museum. 
Um, I want to share two things. Um, one is to the lady with uh, regards to the uh, um, hand handicap and uh, uh, less privilege. Um, so in my home museum, for example, we don't, um, we host every group personally. So when we have, um, it's not wheelchair friendly, it's not um, elderly friendly. I have a steps that people need to go up because I don't have a lift in my house. So um, one thing we did was when the elderly couldn't go up, we brought things down to show the person. So even though it was a small example, it was a small token, but it meant a lot. Another thing we did was um, when we celebrated our 10th anniversary, we invited the deaf community to paint part of the house. And that was our way of um, getting the deaf to interpret um, local culture. Um, my question to Mr. Vinod is that in your 10 points, there were many times when you shared about how success of, uh, uh, you, you equated success to the quantity of people that attended the exhibition or visited, which I think it's fair because many times you use number uh, of visitors as KPI. But is there any other benchmark apart from um, number of visitors to, to determine if an exhibition is successful or not? Thank you. Um, you mean in terms just of exhibitions or any of the other aspects? I in general. Say in general, I don't think in terms of numbers alone we see. For example, when we work with certain source communities, uh, you know, it's not a question on audience numbers, but it's a question on that community being satisfied. So it could be a percentage of people being satisfied with the access they have to the collections. I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. There are certain indigenous groups whose collections are there at the museum. So they need, they won't come as a general public because they got to go to the storage and they got special access. Now even within special access, there could be some collections that not everyone can see. And you have to respect the rights, you know, that, that not everyone can see based on a whole range of issues including, you know, gender, there are some where maybe, you know, dead people are represented, so, you know, there are restrictions. But then th your measure is, was that community satisfied? Because that's part of a mandate, is to make sure that you provide access, safekeeping for the collections, and make sure the community can access it when they want, and they're satisfied. So, you know, that becomes a bit of a measure. So, it, it, it depends quite a lot, you know, in terms of various. Then same with staff. I mean, I, I, I can't see one good museum in the world that has got very bad staff, but the museum is good. So, you, you know, your whole success is how good a staff force you have. Um, I'll, I'll throw a small example. Um, I won't name the museum. This particular museum was a disaster. And they got a new director who's been the director for the last eight years. It was a disaster bec before because every time they wanted to do something, the staff would go on strike. And the museum is closed. Nothing happens. And exhibitions are coming in, there's a strike and everything is closed. Ever since this person came in, there's not been a single strike. And he would go talk to them, find out what the issues are before and they started trusting him. And that was the big transformation you know, for the museum. So that's, that's a measure of success. So it's, it's a whole range of things, you know, it's, it's probably not, not a very simple answer. Does that make sense? Thank you for giving us 10 points uh, to think about. Um, I would like to go back to your first point of relevance and I think it was interesting how you approached about the community and how to engage them and also seeing the museum as a connector. Could you maybe elaborate a bit more on what could be possibilities to, to use the museum as a connector for the community? See, I think, um, you know, in terms of the local population, I didn't highlight on that because I think every, 
you do it so well in Singapore. So, I, you know, I, I thought, because in terms of, you know, the public, you know, the night music, there's a whole range of things you do to, to, to connect to the public, which is great. What I actually wanted to do was just highlight a few things, you know, which are more, a bit more far-fetched, you know, where you've got collections from source communities that you have here. And the museums are custodians of that. How do you do something back to benefit those communities? I won't get too deep into the Singapore context because I don't know enough. But in, in places like Australia or India or, you know, wherever, say in Australia you have a whole range of Pacific Island communities that are isolated. You know, they, they don't have a, a strong connection back to the home museum or the museum here. What programs can you do that you would connect? I think that's quite important, especially for the diaspora communities. You know, whether it's, it's a special day you have for the Pacific kids to come, you know, the Pacific day where you got, you know, they drink kava and you got a kava evening, whatever it is, right? I mean, it's a, it's a whole range of, of things you do. And also equally, those people living, let's say, in Solomon are never going to come and visit the collections here. What can you do to take things back? That's where the suitcase concept, I mean, these are just examples because you can be lateral and think of so many different options. That was done in an era where internet wasn't that, that great. Even now, I think in many of the places, internet is not that great. So it's more, I mean, you go to, you know, the small towns and villages, what can you do? So the whole concept is how do you take it from, from you know, here and connect to out there and in the process, get a cultural rejuvenation, get a connection and all that. The win-win is the local community has got access to the collection, they are quite happy and maybe there are some people with that kind of an artistic mindset who might recreate certain things. But for the main museum, I mean, I hate saying this, but in your collection database, if you really see, there would be a percentage that has been labeled wrong. Because it was all done where something, somebody had written something in a card, you know, that it was from this place, but it's not. And, and the museum benefits because you, you can correct it with the kind of feedback you get. So it's, it's a win-win for both. And so that's what I mean by, by you know, taking it to the source communities and, and, and looking at, at you know, how, how to do that. Ultimately, you are the only custodian for some of the cultural heritage, which they don't have or nobody else has. Any question? If not, actually, I would like just to jump in. Um, we not just spoke about, um, well, cultural agencies or museums are just like uh, custodians, basically. You know, you are in a way facilitators, you know, to, you know, uh, to bridge collections with the people. So, uh, and earlier on, you talked about, um, you know, having the right people with the right skills to engage the community. So um, I was wondering if you can elaborate and share with us, you know, uh, you know, the result of this so-called so irreversible development of, you know, uh, the collections being used for community engagement. You know, what, what do you think would be the impact on the role of curators and even conservators? You know, <laughs> yeah, because, um, you, know, uh, you know, what would be the impact? On, on the work that they do, because they are collection keepers, so to speak. So, your thoughts on that, yeah. Um, I, I think it's, it's, it's a hard question, but in short, um, providing access to collections becomes more and more important, and which basically means a lot of your time would be taken away by taking them to collections and getting them to interact and showing. So that's, that's a direct impact on time. Because when everyone's flat out, you know, writing or, or doing analysis or conserving objects. So that would be something which I have noticed because there are so many groups coming and once they know this, they'll make appointments and they'll come and they want to spend time and you need a conservator to handle the object and et cetera, et cetera. The second one is, the whole issue of digitizing means you need to really clean the object 
and photograph it. I mean, you can't photograph a dirty object and put it up on the web. So there is a stronger push to get more and more collection digitized and put on the web. And that is, is one more issue in terms of, of you know, your, your time and you know, how much money and effort you need to, to put in there to, to push it so that you know, it, it just goes into mainstream. And the third impact also I can think of is the mediums because sometimes something like the intangible heritage, you got things that are not meant to last a long time which you are adding to your collection. So when you look at videos and films and all that, now you buy an object. It's not just the object, it comes with a lot of photos on how the artist was making the object, plus a bit of videos on something, and you have now a mandate to, to kind of preserve everything. Before it was just the object which would be a lot more easier. So it, it's got many different dimensions. I mean, is that, is that clear? Does, do it make sense? To, yeah, so I think especially for a conservator that becomes a bigger issue on how you preserve some of the modern materials and you do a whole range of things, which is a, a bit of a nightmare. Hi there, uh, my name is Ximing. I'm involved in like, um, well, I've been doing some writing as well as, um, I've also done some courses on, on history and heritage. Um, so I um, really appreciate your discussion on intangible heritage. Like, um, okay, about, apart from the use of the objects and also this example of like um, this river Ganges, like where the, the whole experience of people going there and it's a site which is out there and not within a museum. So um, I, I'm just wondering whether you think there is maybe a need for a paradigm shift in how we perceive uh, museums or how a museum can operate because uh, most of the times we think of museums as a collection of objects and activities would usually surround, um, revolve around the objects, how to interpret those objects. But uh, to a lot of people in the local community, um, they think of heritage, not in terms of a collection um, from a, a whole region, but in terms of um, what they, they um, perform in festivals or, or lo the local arts. So it's like for them, like, w why do I need to walk into the museum if I, you know, if, you know, if our fathers or grandfathers are the custodians of our culture? So how, how, how do you bridge that gap? Uh, I, I don't think, you know, there's an easy answer at all, but Look, I mean, a museum's, uh, the way they define museums, there are many definitions. One is, a museum is a safe place for unsafe ideas, they say. So, you know, there, there are many ways you, you can, you know, skin a museum. But I think, end of the day, the museum's role includes collecting and making sure those objects are safe. It's important, because if you don't do it, no one else would do it. I mean, that's the only place where a, a whole range of objects. But at the same time, taking that too far, that being the only thing, is, is, is what I think is changing. Because you can probably add a whole range of other things, and sometimes you might, might sacrifice an object because of that. I mean, I'll, I'll throw an example, don't, don't quote me. You take a bit of a risk, right? I won't say which museum, whatever it is. Uh, you know, there was one project where this museum had a lot of kava bowls. You know, the kava bowls are ones, I, I don't know whether you know what a kava is. Kava is the root of a plant that you kind of mix with water and you filter it. So you just have a cloth, so you filter it and then you drink it. it it's, it's an intoxicant and it's very common in the Pacific. So it's, it's a very common drink that you have. And there's this bowl that's got many decorations which is used. So there were lots and lots of kava bowl and the local community was very interested to come to the museum and have a kava ceremony and consecrate one of the bowls. So they asked, there was a little bit of discussion, and then finally there was consensus to use one of the bowls to use it, which had never been used before. But of course conservators did take certain precautions where they made sure it was humidified at 100% kind of thing and all that so that it's not a sudden shock and it was used, 
and then after that it was dried and put back. But now it's, it's, it's still a cover bowl but it's been consecrated with a cover ceremony. The color has changed a little bit because of the cover ceremony and all that. But it adds value and that particular thing was documented. And now when the bowl's on display, you can have that video that plays along with that and all that. So that's, that's like an interesting one. But it's, it's very much a judgment call, you know. I don't think there's a very set answer. But the predominant role needs to be to make sure the collections are safe. And you know, you, you then take a, a bit of a, a judgment. The other thing that we often struggle with is, you've seen the white glove concept, right? I mean, I mean, all the conservators here know, don't touch anything, you know. But these are custodians whose collections we have, they come here. And telling each one of them to put a white glove means you're separating the object from them. And so once in a while you just say, look, that's okay. You know, you know sweat effects, so just dry your hands as much as possible and then, because they need to feel the object. Like, I mean, they need to touch and feel kind of thing. So those are all little things that you do so that, you know, you, you give a better connection. It's work in progress, but it's more the mindset on how you think. I think that's what's important than rigid yes, no kind of thing. Is that okay? Oh. My name is Ingrid Hansen. I'm part of the Southeast Asian Ceramic Society. I have a particular interest in Changsha bowls and Singapore has the largest concentration of Changsha bowls in the world. There are over 30,000 in your storage. And I was part of the original acquisition team. And it would be interesting for Singapore and for scholars around the world to be able to come to Singapore and study those bowls. They are rather homogeneous and yet each one is different. What is the most effective way that you found in the 40 countries that you've worked in for displaying uh, the volume of objects that we have here? Um, you know, might be. Look, I mean, sometimes you might have a hundred on display just to create the impact, but that's very much a curatorial issue. Or you might just have one on display. But how you do that, you know, is, is very much from a curatorial perspective. But you've got to go back, you don't want to just display for the sake of display. You got to have a reason why you want to provide access. And the way technology is going now, I think the whole digital mechanism. So tomorrow if a researcher wants to say, look, I want to compare the 300 bowls and see what is the difference, whatever it is, they should be able to put it up, pull it up on screen if you can have high quality images. So, you know, my immediate thought is without knowing all the, the details, Maybe that's the best one. Ultimately, I leave it to the curatorial people to decide, you know, how many is the right thing to, to, to display. Speaking about relevance at the beginning of your talk, I just would like to pose this question in the context of today's technology and the trends, uh, especially to do with uh, digital technology. Should museums be trendsetters or should museums be fo trend followers? What's your take? Um, you mean in technology or in ideas? Both. I think in ideas we have our own domain where we are doing things and in that one, you know, very unsafe ideas it's up to us to really put it across. I'll, I'll give you a very simple example. Um, one of the projects I worked on early on was at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. At that museum, we, I mean, that, that time I was working on a project on non-toxic pest control, the low oxygen, which the conservators know. So we went to work uh, on, on a car, a backseat Dodge. I don't know whether you've heard, you, you, you've seen that, that object. And it's a backseat Dodge, the 38 Dodge. In the back seat, there's a boy and a girl making out, you know, typical, you know, America with a lot of beer bottles and everything everywhere. And hardly anyone was there. So, you know, we, we were working, nobody bothered about that object. Then, as part of that object, we did a bit of research. It seems when the museum first put it on display, there were thousands of people protesting, how can you put an object like that on display? You know, it's bad for a youth. The local council said, I'll cut your funding if you don't take it out. 
right? But the museum stood and they said, look, it's time, you know, this is what happens in society. I want to bring it out in the open and put that in and that's what museums are. So, you know, from that perspective, it's, it's got to be your, your forward thinking, you, you need to put those ideas and with time, the rest of society followed. Right? I mean, that's just a small example just to show, you know, what, what museums really need to be is, is, is safe. I know in some parts of the world it's not easy because when you put unsafe ideas, you might not last too long. So, you know, it's, it's really a question of, of, you know, you being judgmental but where you push boundaries and I really appreciate what happens in Australia and, and US and, you know, you, you test it. I mean, there's protesters, you know, they'll say, I, I don't know, there was one called I think they had a, uh, a cross in a urine, a photograph kind of thing. And that really got everyone aggravated. Uh, I think it, it's called Piss Christ or something like that. And it's interesting because I once went to see the curator and in, in, the, in the side of the room that painting was sitting there. And so, uh, you know, it's a photo. And I said, look, what? he said, oh, that's a painting that caused all the controversy. And that was sitting, you know, absolutely quietly, but that triggered a whole range of debates. So, I mean, sometimes, you know, you don't want to tri trigger unwanted debates, but it's a question on saying, look, you know, what is sacred, you know, is, 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 is the cross the sacred thing or the concept, you know, I mean, it, it's all, you know, people start debating and, and, and questioning and those kind of things, which is something the museum should do. I mean, that's what arts is all about. Anyone has any question? Um, I think we have, if I may ask this question, uh, I think we have some colleagues from the gallery, you know, and, uh, you know, um, we have been talking a great deal about, uh, I would say, uh, mostly um, materials from, say, source communities, artifacts, and all that. So. Um, you share with us, like, for example, uh, how would these issues, um, you know, apply to uh, um, museums that have visual arts collections, particularly contemporary uh, collections, yeah. Um, I mean, I use the word museums in a very generic way. So it can be museum or a gallery or a library or an archive, anywhere where there's collection. We just call it a museum. So in, in many ways, the concepts are the same. You know, just based on ICOM's definition, any collecting place is a museum. So you, I mean, I'm pretty sure the gallery people would, would have similar issues. You know, you might have a, a painting that's, that's probably got some kind of an, an, an ethnographic, uh, you know, um, uh, link to, to some source culture. Uh, or you might have a contemporary art that has come in from a particular festival, you know, that, that no longer is there. So, I, I mean, the short answer is I think the concepts are the same across. So, people who come from libraries, it's the same thing. You know, it, it, it's a question on, you know, how you approach. Uh, Any final questions from anyone? Oh, out of, just out of curiosity, you visited so many different countries and so many different museums. What makes Singapore stand out? I've got a flight only tomorrow morning, so I better be careful what I say. <laughs> no, look, I mean, the, the short answer is, I think it's bubbling. And I think, you know, I mean, look, the museums are good, everything is great, but what stands out is, I think the excitement and the enthusiasm, and I was having um, dinner with some people, and one thing they said that, that, that I still remember is, um, Singapore loves ideas, new ideas, and they're constantly looking at new ideas and trying to implement and trying to make the change, and I think that's the kind of things that, that we do. I mean, we're not satisfied that, that you know, we you know, lots been achieved. I mean, I think in terms of, you know, where where you are. I mean, it's phenomenal. 
but you're not stopping. I mean, you're, you're constantly saying, look, let me rethink, let me recreate, let me have new ideas. And it's, it's like, you know, the IT sector. Every day you need a new idea, right? And, and if the museum sector also does that, I think that's, that's where the growth is. I mean, the way you're going, you be trendsetters, trendsetters for the rest of the world. If you go at the same rate for 20 more years, then ultimately you would probably dictate what museums should do. No further questions from anyone? Yeah. Oh, just one last question. Just one more. Uh, in, in your experience with the various museums, uh, how do they have the autonomy, I mean, in the sense if they're public museums, to present an alternative perspective, a narrative, aside from the stated official, historical, or political perspective of certain political events? Thank you. <laughs> it's, I think it's a good question. Um, the ones that directly report to the government struggle with that idea a bit. If you have a board, you can hide behind because, you know, somebody else gets all the firing and by the time it comes down, it's a bit less. But uh, no, I, I don't think there's a very simple answer. You do anything that doesn't toe the line, there'll be some flack that will come. But if you have a board and a degree of autonomy, um, you are a bit more bolder. Otherwise, you've got to go for approvals for everything. Uh, I, mean, I won't name countries, but many countries, the museums are directly line managed by the government. So the government of the day would dictate you know, what, what needs to be said. Even the storylines get run through certain people which is not how it should be. I mean, end of the day, the way I see a museum, a good museum is, anyone from the general public should come and say, look, what they're saying, they're not biased one way or the other. I mean, if a company puts something together, you know that they're biased towards you buying a product. If the government of the day does something, you know it's biased on their own political line. So what a museum really needs to do is put that story very accurately, or if there are two views, I mean, a simple example is you take, you know, was it evolution or creation? Put both the cases. It's up to the general public to, to take both the cases, go debate on it, and, and you need to be a platform where you say, look, here is all the scientific basis for both. I don't, you know, go on, on one, one camp or the other. So I think, you know, having that. There are some countries that, that, are, that do it more, and also it's, it's also defined by who the director is and how much risk they want to take. I mean, it's, it's not a simple answer. But having a board gives you a buffer. Having a board or whatever thing, you know, between you and the government. Otherwise, you know, your funds don't get approved too. Okay. Um. <laughs> Well, I think, um, um, well, I just add that basically to me personally, museums are places for, um, you know, uh, for visitors to uh, discover, you know, um, you know, their own stories as well as perhaps weave new narratives, you know, and, and that's why the museums are great facilitators for conversations and they are not just about objects itself. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Maybe it's time for me to ask one question, if, if I may. What's the best museum any of you have been to? I mean, is there a good example? British Museum. S sorry? British Museum. A anyone else? What, what's a museum that, that really stands out? Sorry? In the world? In Singapore? No, anywhere, anywhere, anywhere. And, and, and why does it stand out? The design is impressive and the display of the objects allows the viewer to see them 360 degrees. Everything is clearly labeled, the lighting is spectacular and the collection is probably the best in the world. Wow. Any other thoughts? You, you want to see? 
What about people in the back? People from HCC, what's, what's your favorite museum? <laughs> I, I see a whole crowd there, so. <laughs> see, from my perspective, um, I mean, I do agree on objects and all that, and I think it's very important. But parallelly, it's also how the community connects to the museum, which, you know, I, I think it's, it's, it's a mix of so many different things. I've, I used to travel to the Pacific a lot. And s some of the places, it's like the community, for them, it's where they meet in the evenings. You know, they come, they have, you know, dances, or they might, you know, have a kava ceremony or, you know, whatever, but it's, it's part of their, their backyard. So it's, it's that combination between, you know, the display and how you connect to the community and, and all that. I mean, not that, you know, one model would be applicable to everybody. It's, it's a question on, on, you know, you having, you know, the whole broader approach here. Thank you so much. I, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your questions and your time today in attending the Culture Academies in Clays. May I, may I now also invite Ms. Dangam to present a token of appreciation to Mr. Daniel. Um. <laughs> All right. um, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of today's session. Um, in conversation with Session. We would like to take this opportunity, uh, opportunity to thank the Asian Civilization Museum for hosting us. Um, thank you again for joining us. We hope that you have a wonderful evening. Um, we also have some tea in the back for you, so please feel free to hang back, network, meet some new people. Thank you again for attending.